I'm Alan Percy. I'm a pediatric neurologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I work in the Children's Hospital of Alabama. I've been related to Rett syndrome since 1983, when I was at Baylor, actually, and saw my first girl with Rett syndrome there. Been uh, actively engaged in many aspects of Rett syndrome, uh, led the U.S. Natural History Study of Rett syndrome, which ran from 2003 to 2021. We enrolled girls or women, some boys, in this uh, study beginning in 2006. Actually, if you go back five or eight years, the number of clinical trials in the Rett syndrome has increased dramatically, and two products were tested at the phase three level, which is a pivotal study level, allowing a successful application to the Food and Drug Administration for release of the compound. But in addition to that, there are at least 15 other compounds that are under some level of investigation either at the preclinical level or in the phase one or phase two. In addition to that, since uh, 2023, uh, two gene replacement therapies have been initiated. Both are American companies. So one trial actually started in Canada, but has now moved in part to the U.S. as well. And the other study is taking place in the U.S. So the landscape of clinical research directed at providing treatment for individuals with Rett syndrome has really ramped up dramatically. This is a really uh, interesting aspect. Many of the individuals who are receiving trifinitide now on a per treatment basis are having it provided by their uh, local physicians, generally primary care physicians, which exciting but also it kind of left us out in the in the dark. But it's a, it's a good dark to be in, to know that uh, physicians in the community are taking an active interest in uh, using this medication. Release of the medication was based on pretty sound data. And since that time, we have offered it to all girls or women and, and some boys who we see on a regular basis. Difference between a clinical trial and a treatment process is that in a clinical trial, you're pretty much limited to the dose you give. You start at a full dose and, and go from there. Whereas in practice, what we have been doing is starting at roughly 50% of the recommended weight-based dose and uh, escalate it uh, on a weekly or biweekly basis as is tolerated. The reason for this is obviously the side effects, which are diarrhea principally, and to some extent, vomiting. In the uh, clinical trial, 80% of individuals in that trial had some aspect of diarrhea, in some cases significant enough that the, there was a relatively small number who withdrew from the study because of that. So we started a lower dose and escalated slowly. And if there is a problem, uh, we maybe go back to the prior dose to see how that is tolerated and after a period of time, try to go back to the next higher dose. In addition, we have uh, been pretty active in the treatment of diarrhea itself, either by providing fiber, increased fiber in the diet, or by uh, providing a medication uh, which is used ordinarily in the treatment of diarrhea called loperamide. And we are pretty uh, aggressive in that regard. The issue of vomiting, we didn't see in our site during the clinical trial as much as other people did. And we think that is because we recognize that a high percentage of girls with Rett syndrome have gastroesophageal reflux. And we treat them for that with uh, specific medications. And we think that the fact that we did that reduced or eliminated the possibility that they would have vomiting. So we didn't see that as much, but that is an issue that also has to be kept in mind. It's very interesting that during the last phase of our natural history study over the last seven years, we asked the parents or caregivers what their top concerns were, top three concerns. We gave them a list of of 24 items that they could select, 
and they could also add in a pretext item if they wished. And the very top concern among these caregivers or parents was the lack of or difficulty with communication. And that was 25% of the respondents said that. And that actually is where we are seeing the most improvement. There is either better attention, better recognition, better responsiveness to whatever the parent may be asking, what they want, what they're they'd like to do, how they're feeling, if there's anything they need. And there's just a general sense of increased awareness from them. In uh, some instances, we've seen improved hand use, improved walking ability. Those are also in the top five concerns that we saw. We haven't specifically seen reduction in seizures, but the other one of the top concerns is constipation. And obviously that has been relieved in many cases. Now, 80% of the individuals may have some level of diarrhea, but 20% don't. And uh, we recently saw a girl who actually had no diarrhea and had to be put back on uh, a laxative for her constipation, even while taking the medication. So the diarrhea, you have to look at it as it may happen, but we can't predict in whom it will happen. But the basic improvement that we are seeing is attention, interaction, involvement with a family. So the pivotal study was the Lavender study, which is a 12-week trial, equally divided between a placebo group and a treatment group, roughly 93 in each group. They were treated for 12 weeks and they were assessed then by two principal markers. One, the Rett syndrome behavioral questionnaire, which was completed by the parent or caregiver, and the clinical global impression of improvement, which was completed by the physician. And at the end of the 12 week trial, there was a substantial improvement in both measures compared to the placebo group. After the Lavender trial, they moved into the Lilac study where anyone who was in the prior trial could carry on and both the placebo group and the drug treatment group received the actual agent. And interestingly, at the end of the nine-month study to complete the year, both the placebo and the treatment group can continue to improve at a greater improvement than at the 12-week point. In the extension study, LALA2, this was conducted in anyone who had finished LILOC-1 and who would wish to continue the post-study, the outcome measures, that syndrome, behavioral questionnaire, and the CGII, clinical global impression improvement, continue to improve. So after more than a year, a year and a half, there was continued and steady improvement. The question remains, how much more improvement could you expect to see? I think that is a a question that has to be answered in post-marketing research by the, the company. We don't use the same outcome measures in our regular clinic follow-up, so we, we don't really assess that uh, actual information. But we have offered the medication to anyone who is interested, and we have seen some girls or women who have had substantial diarrhea and have had to withdraw. But we've also seen remarkable improvement in other girls who have been able to tolerate the medication, continue the use of the medication. I think the take home message is that first, trophinotide is not a cure, it's not going to fix the disorder, but it does provide incremental improvement over their pre treatment or baseline level with better attention, better interaction, uh, perhaps more physical capabilities, ability to get around and, and interact uh, with, with their family in a more positive way. It is, as I said, it's not a cure. Uh, it's possible that other medications will be uh, needed in the future, and one hopes that they will be uh, tested. And of course, uh, people are holding out hope that the gene replacement therapy and we'll add a, another level of treatment that will be equally or perhaps more effective than the trophinotide itself. The point is that the RET community is, is heavily integrated and interested in therapy, 
uh, of all kinds. We are fortunate in this country uh, that we have a, a reasonable uh, health care delivery system and an ability to provide these medications. And it is up to the physicians to be certain that all have access to this medication so long as they wish it. Thank you.